waiting for me. I haven't seen this one before. Staging an attack around the other side of the car for sure. Back at this side. I don't know what this thing is doing. Go on. Go find Peter. Go on. Cha cha cha. Go on. Go on. Terrifying. Oh, this is great. I haven't seen this one before. The other giant one probably called this one in for assistance. It's going to act as like a scout or diversionary tactic. Run on now. Go on. Go find Peter. Go on. Go on. It's making that mud curdling noise. Go on. Rouse. I'm looking at the glowing eyes. Rouse. 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 Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a, you know, I got to admit it's a little bit of an improvement. There's no doubt. We're almost into November. The weather has gotten a little bit better, uh, but you know, I'm still sweaty. I mean, I've done the photos of this car, which always makes it worse because uh, frankly, for an old fat guy like me, that's work, you know? Um, but there is a cooling breeze and hopefully it's gonna dry me off as I go around this car and uh, I will feel a little bit better. Uh, we also do have some sort of a front that's blowing through at the moment, and the weekend is supposed to be much, much nicer. Uh, weather in the low 60s, you know, as a low, and uh, somewhere around 80-ish as a high, which uh, is, you know, bearable. It's kind of the minimal, minimum season weather that I'd like to have. Uh, I will also say this, I'm going to North Carolina next week, there's an auction up there, and it's supposed to be really cold. It looks like the days that I'm going to be there, there's another front blowing through, and I might even get some weathers uh, in, the, in the 30s, which is just fantastic. Uh, that is exactly the kind of shit that I am looking for. Um, so with any luck, that does happen. Maybe I'll even check in from there. I'll try. I, you know, I don't know. I always have these grand, ambitious plans that don't come to anything. Uh, but anyway, I dig, look, I'm not going to keep rambling on. I will say there was a cat attack this morning. Uh, one of Peter's cats, one I haven't seen before came at me. Uh, it was pretty violent, but I managed to evade it, and uh, I think I shoot it away. Hopefully it's gone now. Maybe Peter's looking after it. Uh, so that's gone. Otherwise, the animal front is pretty quiet. Uh, birds, deer, you know, whatever else. I just don't see too many of them. So we're going to leap into this car and make it a, a nice, concise video. And uh, here it is. This is a 1989 Mercedes-Benz 560 SL Roadster, uh, an R107 chassis, if you will. And I've probably done a dozen of these things over the last few years. I know some of the guys who have um, been watching these videos, oh my God, and oh my, another, oh jeez, Louise. But, you know, I probably haven't done one in this 900-minute format, so uh, I'll just say this is going to be the definitive 560 SL review, maybe the definitive R107 as far as Curious Cars is concerned. And uh, we'll move on from there and probably not do another one, unless I get an old AMG one or something. But otherwise, this is going to be it. So let's just make this the coup de grace on the 560 SL front. Um, I do want to take one quick minute, one quick minute to thank everybody, the viewers. I got this thing in the mail the other day. And I can't, I've got to say that I am very, very honored. It, it from YouTube, uh, I opened it up. I knew it was coming because there was a lot of talk. Uh, but uh, apparently it's, and there's a letter from somebody, I guess she's the CEO of YouTube or something, uh, Susan something, kind of a strange name for a dude. Uh, but anyway, there it is. So 100,000 subscribers, Curious Cars. God bless you all. I, I just can't believe it. I am absolutely stunned uh, that this thing came in the mail and that 100,000 people out there actually want to watch this content. And I mentioned that to YouTube because they screwed up the award thing. They sent me a letter saying, you know, put this code in to get your award, and there was no code. So I sent in a text to some 
snowflake who answered named Cassette. She seemed very nice. She helped me out. Uh, but when I mentioned that, I thought people were insane for watching. She seemed offended, offended by that. I don't know. It seems like snowflakes have no sense of humor. But anyway, a very deep and resounding thank you to everybody who has pitched in and uh, endured and watched this channel and uh, helped uh, make it grow over the years. I really can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I've got some lovely stuff in the mail from people. I haven't answered it yet. I feel terrible about that. I'm so sorry. I'm just not very, I don't, I mean, I have text messages from 2017 that I'm still meaning to answer. I'm just one of those people that doesn't communicate very well. And uh, I curl up in a hole somewhere, uh, you know, immerse myself in hatred and sadness and uh, try to make everything go away. But I promise that uh, I'm going to be answering these things soon. And uh, I can't uh, tell you how much I appreciate the people who have uh, sent letters or even just nice things. A uh, very nice gentleman sent me a bottle of whiskey, which uh, blew me away, absolutely blew me away. And uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. But thank you, everyone who pitched in and uh, subscribed to this channel and uh, has helped it grow over the years. And, you know, here's to some more shitty content on the way. So thank you again. Appreciate it. Thanks, Susan. <clears throat> and uh, we'll uh, see you later with all due respects to Johnny Cash. All right, let's get back into this car. Nineteen eighty nine Mercedes Benz five sixty SL Roadster. Now I know it's like seven minutes into the video, and the people who are just seeing this for the first time, they've never been to this. Hey, what the hell is this guy? Oh my God, they probably bailed out three minutes ago. But uh, for those who have uh, remained, let's just start. Uh, the SL class dates back to 1954, all the way through to current, by the way. Uh, it's a continuous production car since 1954. And uh, truly, I would say it's one of the most historically important models uh, in the automotive world. I mean, it's a, it's a meaningful model uh, in the way the Beetle was, and that wasn't continuously produced. Well, maybe it was. I don't know. If you take into account some of the third world countries. It probably was, but uh, but the SL is right up there with anything else. And the first one, the W198 300 SL Gullwing, uh, is one of the most collectible and sought after cars ever made. A true icon, uh, even immortalized by Andy Warhol, probably in some sort of a drug crazed stupor in a, you know, West Side apartment party, you know, with uh, a young Leona Helmsley there. But um, uh, anyway, even he immortalized it. I mean, it was a true amazing car that uh, is now one of the iconic cars in world history. And it was inspired by a dude named Max Hoffman, who was somebody that we've talked about a few times before. Uh, he was a famous early importer of European cars uh, to the United States. And uh, that served him very well. He, uh, you know, if he wasn't already rich, which he probably was, he became extensively rich as a result of basically introducing cars from Mercedes and Porsche uh, and some others into the United States market. Uh, he was also Dustin's uncle. Uh, so Dustin Hoffman, you know, if you wondered how Dustin Hoffman became a star, and frankly, most everybody does, uh, it turns out that his uncle was an extremely rich importer of European cars to the United States. So he probably paid off some producer, say, hey, put my short little weird nephew in a film. And uh, they did. They put him in a film called The Graduate, which if you remember, had some Alfa Romeos. Well, one, that there was a few, but I mean, it was essentially one one in the movie that uh, Dustin drove around. And those were provided by Max Hoffman, uh, not just because he liked his nephew, which he probably didn't, uh, but because he wanted to promote the brand in the United States, which, uh, you know, Max, pretty clever guy. It worked very, very well in uh, the uh, Aston, uh, Aston Martin, oh, for the love of God. The Alfa Romeos uh, became quite a hit uh, in no small part because of that movie. So uh, The Graduate um, definitely helped out Mr. Hoffman. But Hoffman saw a very strong U.S. market uh, for German cars. And he went to these sort of humorless Germans and said, Hey, man, you know, give me this powerful Mercedes coupe. Uh, that I can sell in the United States. We're going to make a ton of money, and uh, it's going to be fantastic. And the bemused Germans did. They said, oh, the 
hell with it. We'll trust this guy because his name's Hoffman. So uh, they took a Le Mans car, basically, which turned out to be the W198SL. Uh, they gave it more civilized road manners, and they released it in the United States. They even debuted it in the United States at the New York Auto Show uh, as the 300SL Gullwing. Uh, so even from the very beginning, the SLs, which um, <clears throat> stand, by the way, for super light. For many years, there have been arguments over that, even fist fights. Uh, people come to fisticuffs over it, whether it's sport light or super light. And uh, frankly, it wasn't until 2017, and I'll put a picture of this up. I saw it yesterday. Hopefully, I can find it again. When a chance finding in the Mercedes archives confirmed that the original SL was a super light. So that is what the SL stands for. Uh, but anyway, he saw a market for this thing. They brought it out. They put it at the New York Auto Show. Uh, because it was a Le Mans car, uh, it was one, at the time, it was the fastest production car in the world. That, that 163 miles an hour, this thing would do. And it didn't hurt that the car was friggin' stunning. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it used a, um, a big inline six cylinder engine with fuel injection, which was rare at the time, which really pumped up the horsepower. And a very fancy independent suspension, uh, a very fancy race car frame. Uh, it sold very well for you know something that was as expensive as it was and uh, became a hit in the United States. But because it was so expensive, uh, Mercedes also came out with the 190 SL at the same time, uh, which sort of shared the same independent suspension, but that was it. It was based on the platform. It used a unibody instead of a big tube frame uh, on, you know, one of their sort of mid-sized sedans at the time, and this anemic little four-cylinder, but it gave people an option of having the 300 SL look uh, for significantly less money. And those two cars ran from uh, 1954 uh, all the way until 1962. In 57, the Gullwing became a Roadster, uh, a two-seat convertible, which would continue to be the body style for SLs for uh, many, many years after, even all the way through until today. Uh, there were a couple of coupes, but yeah, we'll, maybe we'll get into those, I don't know. Uh, and that was uh, replaced in 1962 by a very famous car called the Pagoda, or the W113 chassis, uh, called the Pagoda, nickname, because uh, of the way it comes up in the corners on the hard top and the trunk. It has this sort of uh, look reminiscent of Japanese architecture. So um, that car was also very, very popular in the U.S., very much geared toward the U.S. I think 40% of sales uh, were in the U.S. There's even one at Graceland, by the way. I was there a few years ago. Don't ask me why. One of the rare trips I took with my lady friend, who now wouldn't go with me to 7-Eleven. She wouldn't make me a sandwich if I was starving. She wouldn't give me water in the desert, this woman. But... What are you going to do? Uh, but anyway, there's one at Graceland that was apparently driven by uh, Priscilla. And uh, that Pagoda, that SL, ran through 1971 uh, when it was replaced by this car uh, in 72, at least in the United States, uh, the R107. And uh, like all the SLs before it, it was widely, wildly, very popular in the United States. Frankly, probably even designed with the United States market in mind. And uh, became a, quite a remarkable car here. Uh, a star of TV and the movies, uh, frequent. I mean, you couldn't even name them all. I couldn't even get, I mean, look, I'm gonna do a spattering. Uh, heart to Heart, one of the most famous examples of this car. Uh, it appeared in Dallas, it appeared in Miami Vice. There was an episode in Chips where some rich guy bought Punch and John a couple of Mercedes. One of them was one of the, you know, an R107. Starsky and Hutch, and uh, just countless others. In the movies, you've got uh, Beverly Hills Cop, uh, that was really famous, the red one running around in that with Eddie Murphy in it. You've got uh, Casino had an R107. Uh, American Gigolo had an R107. Caddyshack had an R107. They had uh, Never Say Never Again, uh, a Bond movie, A Fish Called Wanda. And of course, probably the most famous example of an R107 uh, in the movies was the uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Uh, apparently it featured quite heavily in that, although I don't really remember the movie. 
Uh, I did see the first one, but I don't think I ever stuck around for the second. Uh, it was designed by a guy named, well, under a guy named Friedrich Geiger, uh, who was the guy who preceded uh, the famous Bruno Sacco as the Mercedes-Benz design chief. And uh, Friedrich was quite a guy. He had done some cars you might know, like the 540K, uh, an amazing car that, you know, I think Hitler had one of those he drove around. Uh, and also, of course, the uh, W198 300 SL he was responsible for. So uh, the guy was an absolute master. I'm not sure he penned this car, but uh, he certainly was the uh, chief at the time that it was designed and uh, later became uh, uh, replaced by uh, good old Bruno. Um, so he was a pretty interesting guy. Uh, this particular SL is a 1989, which is considered by many to be the most desirable, the 560 SL. Uh, there were many incarnations of this car, uh, even though they all shared the same basic architecture, same basic bodywork. Uh, I don't know it for a fact, but you could probably pull a fender off a 72 model and put it on this car, uh, even though it you know came out, what, 17 years later. So uh, whether or not it's the most collectible most desirable. To me, that's highly debatable. Uh, I find a lot to like about every, I, even the 380 SLs, which are considered kind of the most anemic of the bunch, a malaise era car. Uh, I like them uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, one of them is the lighter V8, I think, is uh, a nice complement to the chassis. I like the chrome door handles that aren't sunken, like the aero ones on this car. Uh, but, um, you know, for whatever it's worth, uh, most people tend to think these 560s are the most uh, most desirable, and they're certainly the most refined and easiest to live with. That part of it's inarguable. Uh, it was the only Mercedes convertible made during its entire production run, nothing else. They never made a W123 or 126 convertible, which is a shame. That would have been kind of cool. And the uh, 124 Cabrio didn't come out till a few years later. Uh, this car was replaced by the uh, R129 in 1990, another car that featured heavily in that rookie movie. Um, but uh, yeah, there it is. So 19, that was the year I graduated high school, by the way. Uh, so let's look at the events of 89 to say, okay, so let's see the world that this thing was released onto. Uh, a gallon of gas was 97 cents. <clears throat> 97 cents. And I remember that. I remember that vividly because I drove a V8 Firebird at the time and I'd go to 7-Eleven and I was pissed off that it was, oh my God, gas is almost a dollar. <sighs> yeah, those were the days. Uh, the average home cost 120 grand. <laughs> I mean, oh my God. Yeah, that's like it is today. And the average car cost $15,000. Uh, this one, by the way, cost $64,000. So uh, it gives you an idea of just the exclusivity that this car had at the time. Uh, I mean, it was not just double or triple what the average car cost. It was insane. It was the equivalent of $143,000 today. Uh, so, I mean, if you drove one of these things, you had a I mean, you were a bad mofo. You were very, very well-to-do. And, uh, you know, that sort of should give you an idea. It costs more than a new SL does. I mean, you can option out or AMG an SL and make it cost more than that. But your average... You know, base price SL in 1989 cost 143 grand, and that really does tell you something about how these cars were built. Uh, the biggest news of 89 has to be the end of the Cold War. I mean, nothing bigger. Uh, you had the Berlin Wall come down, you know, Reagan's little thing worked, it came down. And then you had George Bush, who had just been inaugurated as president. He met the guy with the birthmark uh, on his face. What the hell? Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. He met him in Malta, and uh, they officially declared the end of the uh, Cold War. They hit the reset button with Russia and uh, ended the Cold War, and uh, obviously that was a pretty big deal. Uh, there was also some news from Asia. There was the Tiananmen Square stuff that came. You remember that guy with the tank standing? I mean, that was one of the most moving and inspiring. I mean, still to this day, it like brings a tear to my eye uh, when I see the videos of that. The bravery and courage of that cat was absolutely astounding. Astounding, and uh, if you remember that protest uh, against the red Chinese government uh, ended in a rather violent crackdown. Uh, the identity of that guy who stood in front of the tanks has never really been officially established. There's been a lot of talk about who he was, but uh, never anything official. 
and uh, there's a lot of debate about what happened to him. Uh, my suspicion is that it did not. We had flies. We had flies. Jesus. My suspicion is that it didn't end well for the poor cat. I have a feeling that he got tortured to death in some, you know, dungeon somewhere. But uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe he's living it up in Taiwan, and I hope so. I hope he is. That guy was incredible, and God bless him. Uh, you also had the Exxon Valdez, if you remember that. Apparently, uh, Captain Stooping got very, very drunk on wine coolers and uh, started chasing uh, Julie around the Lido deck uh, with very bad intentions. Uh, the ship started steering itself. It went off course. It crashed into some rocks off Prince William Sound uh, in Alaska and spilled shitloads of gallons of oil into the ocean, which ended up on the shore and probably some of Gophers' aftershave. And uh, all these birds and seals and whatever else were covered in oil. And uh, the the good news that came out of that is it spawned a whole new advertising campaign for Dawn soap, uh, which lauded itself for washing down oily pen. And we've had to deal with that ever since. So uh, you had that going on. Uh, Russia bailed out on Afghanistan. They left there in a very tidy and organized way. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the Velvet Revolution uh, occurred in Czechoslovakia, where people sort of bailed on that government. And it always, you know, when I hear the Velvet Revolution, it makes me think of those dogs playing poker on one of those uh, uh, paintings on the wall. Uh, Ted Bundy, who rode the lightning in Florida, good old Florida, you can always count on us for, you know, frying these people. Uh, Iran issued a fatwa for Salman Rushdie for some book he wrote, if you remember that, which amounted to absolute shit, by the way. I mean, what a worthless fatwa. Uh, I mean, the guy's still running around. He's like 75 years old. He's still giving speeches. Uh, you know, way to go, Ayatollah. Your fatwa amounted to absolute shit. The guy frankly had a fantastic life and uh, speaking of uh, from Leona Helmsley who was at that Andy Warhol party she's now old at the end of the 80s and uh, she um, did some sort of tax fraud thing that became famous where she said the little people paid taxes or, and uh, but you know, that probably spawned all that really nasty grungy liberalism in the 90s so uh, you know fuck you Leona for for that shit and uh, in car news, Ford bought Jaguar, Yugo went bankrupt, and uh, in the most pressing news to this particular car in this video, uh, Toyota came out with a company called Lexus, which would absolutely set Mercedes on its ass. So uh, there is 1989, and uh, we're now ready to get into this car. But I'm going to take a two-minute break to get my shit together before we do. So bear with me. All right, so while I'm getting my shit together, there's that cat again stalking me out in the corner. I don't know where his giant friend is. Hopefully he stays wherever the hell he is. And this one goes off into the woods and maybe eats that armadillo. Uh, but uh, anyway, look, while I'm getting my crap together, I want to show you this real quick. Peter's doing some work on his, uh, I think this is 71, maybe a 70. It's a 300 SEL 6.3. Uh, it's a W109 model. This is a very famous car for Mercedes-Benz. Uh, it was a big sedan, obviously, uh, at the time. Uh, it used the engine from the 600 Pullman, uh, which to me is one of the greatest Mercedes of all time. It was made very famous by Dan Aykroyd in uh, Trading Places, actually. Uh, but it used this engine, this famous M, uh, what is it, the M100 V8 from that, uh, in what was a smaller, although still enormous, car, uh, and turned it into a real muscle car. In fact, the first AMG car was built on this thing. and. Uh, Frankly, I'd love to do a video on this thing someday because it's just absolutely cool uh, with the stacked headlights and the big V8 and all the other crap. Uh, but uh, this is the true purpose of my visit. This used to be my visit. I don't even know what the hell that means. This used to be my golf cart. I sold this to Peter back when I was buying my house. Uh, I was moving out of a neighborhood that was uh, conducive to golf carts into one that wasn't. And I thought, okay, I don't need this thing. I need some dough at the time. Man, this was a show cart, an absolute show cart. And look, you can see what this guy does to golf carts. I mean, this is where golf carts come to get destroyed. And uh, I, unfortunately, the one that I've built uh, is going to suffer the same fate. Look at this thing. I mean, he's using it to change chainsaw blades. Uh, you can see the rear seat that I had lovingly installed is now in pieces. Uh, all the lights, the I mean, man, I loved this thing. And it looks like 
somebody's ass right now. I put a big horn on the top, I put speakers in it, gauges, satellite radios, all kinds of shit. And uh, this is what has become of it. I mean, look at the hardware I used with little skulls on them. Those things cost a fortune. They were like eight bucks a piece. The rear view mirror. Even the club car logo. Look at that. I mean, who peels that back and why? So anyway, if you want your golf cart to turn to absolute shit, just, you know, let Peter look after it for a while. And that's offensive as hell. But um, anyway, there it is. And we'll get back into things in a second. All right, so we've been very lucky with the sun so far, so I'm going to stop pushing it. We're just going to get into it. Um, this is, a, again, an 89.560. Look at the birds. Yeah, now they have shitloads of them. I keep flying. Anyway, it came out in 1986, and it was an answer to the Malaise era 380 SL that had thrown everything into convulsions in the Mercedes world. Uh, you know, when the Malaise shit hit, all of a sudden Mercedes had to go like everybody else did. Even though the 380 was pretty great at the time, uh, it still had sort of anemic horsepower. And uh, at the same time in Europe, there was a 500 SL, uh, which had lots of horsepower and was very, very desirable uh, to people in the United States. And it opened up this whole gray market thing uh, where clever dudes started bringing over 500 SLs to America and selling them to uh, private citizens. They had to federalize them, you know, the lights and this, that, the other. But, um, but they did that and people bought them up in droves. And this drove the American Mercedes-Benz dealers insane uh, that they were losing out on all this money uh, you know while the uh, people weren't buying the 380 SLs with the same frequency so that went on for a few years Mercedes-Benz ended up uh, lobbying Congress and making new you know it took a while but they ended up basically doing away with the gray market uh, but Mercedes-Benz came out with the 560 SL as a response using this big 5.6 liter aluminum V8 from their S-Class sedan, uh, shoehorning it into uh, this R107 chassis and creating a car that the American public really, really wanted. And they did. Uh, ironically, I, it was not immediately available in Europe. They still ran with the 500, which technically had more horsepower uh, because when this thing came here, uh, it uh, the 275 horse it had in Europe with the uh, lack of emissions uh, was then stuffed and choked by our catalytic converters which put it down to like 230 which is fascinating to me with Europe being so liberal it seems weird that they had the uh, uh, lighter restrictions on bumpers and uh, catalytic converters and that sort of thing at the time even headlights so yeah who the hell knows how that goes but anyway so the 560 SL came here to Japan to Australia and uh, was an instant hit uh, it was shockingly expensive it had only three options uh, at least in the United States it was loaded with everything you could get, basically. Uh, you could get heated seats. That was an option. They're rare, but I have seen them. And apparently you could get some sort of electrically oper electrically operated orthopedic backrests, which must be incredibly rare because I've seen a shitload of these cars and I have never seen that option. Uh, rear seats, I think you could get them in Europe, but in America they were installed by dealers uh, or you bought them aftermarket. You could get these uh, rear seat things put in. Uh, only 8,000 or so were produced in 89. 47,000 560s all in all, uh, but 8,000 uh, in 89, and that's a pretty low production number, which is another reason these things are pretty uh, collectible. Uh, this one is finished in astral silver, which is, of course, uh, you know, they, they've called it a variety of different names over the years, but it's, it's metallic silver, and it's the Mercedes-Benz signature color, uh, the way red is the signature color of uh, uh, Ferrari, or green is the signature color of Jaguar. Uh, Mercedes are just silver, which makes sense with the Germans being all austere and conservative and whatnot. Um, 
And it, and it is. I mean, it's got very subtle styling that's still absolutely beautiful. It's got lovely little creases, lovely little hood bulges, but nothing that screams out at you. I mean, it's just the complete package, and it's gorgeously styled uh, to be kind of austere and minimalist, uh, while at the same time making quite an impact when it shows up. Uh, they had an aluminum hood. Uh, they had 15-inch wheels. The prior cars had 14-inch wheels. Uh, on the bottom underneath the bumper, you can see that plastic air dam. That was a 560 SL thing. Uh, you can also see the enormously large bumpers, which were significantly bigger than what was uh, on the European cars, which, uh, frankly... Look, I don't mind these bumpers. I'm not arguing that they look better. I don't want to suffer all the vicious attacks that people, you know, it, it is a decided fact that the world thinks the European bumpers, which are much, much shorter and smaller uh, because they didn't have to comply with bumper laws, uh, are uh, better looking. But you have to remember, like when I was a kid in the 80s, 80, what a, these are the cars that I knew. I mean, these I thought these bumpers were perfectly normal. I, I wasn't surrounded by European cars at the time, uh, European release cars. So these are the ones that I thought they had. I mean, you know, you saw some of the Euro cars out there. Uh, uh, they also had these four round sealed beam headlights because uh, American headlight laws didn't allow for these big composite um, high output, you know, Euro lights that the European cars had. Uh, so we had these four rounds. I also like those. To me, they look quite elegant. And I frankly like them better uh, than the European headlights that you see. And again, I realize I'm not in the mainstream, so don't attack me. This is just what I like because it's what I grew up with. And uh, I think it looks absolutely terrific. And I still do today. Uh, they also got flush door handles. These, you know, this was kind of a safety thing, probably more than it was any kind of, a, you know, drag coefficient thing. Uh, the old 380 SL handles were big chrome suckers that stuck out and maybe they killed pedestrians or something. I don't know. Uh, but uh, anyway, they sunk them in on the 560 SLs. And uh, frankly, it's another, it's one of the, I prefer the 380 SL door handles. Uh, they improved the seats. They became more orthopedic and comfortable. Uh, they improved the suspension. Uh, it got ABS brakes. It got an airbag. It got four, well, it always had four wheel independent, but it has the four wheel disc brakes, four speed automatic, and, uh, you know, sway bars and so on and so forth. Uh, you could also get a detachable. Well, telling you, every one of them came factory with a detachable hard top and then a soft top system. So uh, the soft top is kind of minimalist. It seals very well, but it's not overly engineered. That's because it was meant to just be thrown up in inclement weather. Uh, the true hard top for this car is what you would use in the winter or, you know, other times when you needed the thing to basically become a coupe. And not only did it seal incredibly well, the hard top, and um, I'm going to pretend to make a pause here because if I if I can put it together I'll do a two minute segment with the hard top on at work today uh, but we'll see so there's the pause all right so here is a quick walk around with the uh, hard top in place uh, it's been in storage on a stand with a cover so the back window is a little dusty but you know why the hell would they bother cleaning that up as part of the detail they wouldn't <laughs> doesn't matter anyway um, but you can see, I think the car is actually quite handsome uh, with the hard top. It adds more chrome. Uh, it has a, a very nice sort of sleek design at the back. And uh, frankly, I think it looks... Somebody's jumping on it. I think it looks terrific. So uh, there it is. Quick little shot here at work with the uh, hard top on. And uh, that comes with the stand and cover. And uh, everything looking good and nice. So back to the video. Ended now. Uh, and the uh, soft top was just meant to be, you know, almost like on an MG or something. And uh, the, the hard top was structural, even the way it bolted down. And it says right in the manual do not attempt to install this thing if you're not West German. Don't even try. So, you know, I probably do agree with that. And uh, basically, every SL uh, from the um, 300 SL and 57 onward was a hard top, soft top system, all the way through the uh, R129 until it became a folding hard top with the R230. And uh, there you go. So, uh, let's just get into this car. So, 
Now we're gonna run out of time here for a minute. So here's the trunk. Uh, you pump this little guy here. Uh, this is a neat setup. As somebody pointed out to me before, and those detailers just clean things properly. Anyway, you can apparently turn your trunk in these cars into a safe by uh, turning the key a certain way where, you know, only the key will open it up again. Uh, but if you open up this panel here, and you know, anyone who knows these cars is immediately going to see how clean and nice this one is. It's really shocking. Uh, there you see the jack for the car. You see the original battery box, the straps. These are often broken off and bad examples. Uh, but everything looking nice and proper under there. And that's uh, uh, behind that jack is the vacuum pump because a lot of this car is, the, you know, the door locks uh, and some other stuff all run on vacuum instead of electric motors. I gotta put this uh, YouTube thing. Sorry there, Susan. But if we look under here, uh, this was clever. Mercedes buried the spare tire in the bottom. You put that little strap inside that slit in the top of the trunk lid, and there is the spare. And it's very nice. This has the original spare tire still uh, with the original valve stem cap and attachment for, you know, safety protocols. Uh, the original tool bag, which is quite nice. These are often missing. Some guys rob them and sell them on eBay. And if we open that up, there you go. I mean, who the hell is, I mean, your average SL buyer is not going to whip out these tools at a side of the road and start, you know, fixing valve cover gaskets. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Uh, but anyway, it's a very nice setup there <clears throat> in the trunk and a nice size trunk where you could actually fit shitloads of golf clubs and cargo and keys of cocaine in the 80s and, you know, whatever it is that you needed to cart around with you. So all very cool stuff. Let's have a look under the hood. And there is the sun coming out now, starting to screw us up. Uh, hood release down here, give that guy a tug. Uh, this confounds a lot of people. Uh, you know, they try fooling around looking for the release. The earlier ones had them on uh, the sides. Actually, no, that was the 126. Uh, this one, you reach in here on the left side of the hood star, and there's a little flapper, and then you pop this thing open. And here you see it. So that is a 5.6 liter light alloy V8. It's got uh, twin overhead cams, uh, you know, with a timing chain, a dual chain. The 380 SL started out with a single one, which didn't work well. And uh, it was just a fantastic, powerful engine uh, that really motivated this thing down the road just fine. Uh, you can see everything looks good under there, all very clean, uh, air cleaner on top. Uh, you see this uh, VIN sticker. These are very important on these cars now. Uh, at the time, it was probably meant to uh, combat, you know, theft and chop shops and that sort of thing. But now it serves as a way for you to tell that the car has all of its original sheet metal and has never been in a wreck. So uh, you've got a sticker there on the fender. You've got one on the hood. Uh, you've got one there on the other fender. Here on the uh, core support, you've got the VIN stamped in. Uh, here's the build sheet for the car, or the plate that gives you all the different uh, options and whatnot. All very nice stuff. Uh, you see it still has the original Mercedes-Benz sticker on the bare radiator, the sticker over there on the overflow tank, on the air cleaner, and, you know, collectible-wise, this thing's in pretty terrific shape. So uh, that's made to do a four-speed automatic. Uh, running into a uh, limited slip rear end. So all in all, a very nice setup. Uh, you can also see this still has the original uh, aluminum uh, wiper arms. Very often those things are discarded, uh, which is an absolute shame because it looks terrible without them. You see these black wiper arms on the, uh, on the aluminum silver uh, uh, we see the aluminum silver arms with the black wiper blade. It looks terrible. So it's, you know, it, properly you would put uh, inserts into those original Bosch wipers. And this one still has them, which is absolutely great. Um, there is the uh, aero wheels that we talked about. Uh, there you see the uh, indentation on the side underneath the uh, rubber impact strip. Uh, all very nice stuff. 
Uh, I'm going to pause here for a minute so we can um, put up the soft online. I already did that all this morning. But anyway, I'm going to do that. We're going to put up the uh, soft top and uh, show you how that goes uh, back down again. So uh, hold on one minute. We'll get that done. Uh, and then actually I'm going to put all my crap in the car and I'll probably pull it forward up there out of the sun. Uh, we'll do the interior and then go for a drive. Hold on one moment. All right, so let's get this top down. Normally on these cars, I just do it without filming it and uh, put it down, but I once got griped at about it, that, you know, why didn't you show it going down? It, well, it's not motorized. What difference does it make? It's impossible to do one-handed, but we're going to try anyway. So uh, anyway, here you see, uh, actually, let me go around it. Here it is with the top up. <clears throat> I'm doing this uh, before I do the rest of the video, and I'm going to interject it and I doubt I'll be able to interject it in any kind of a seamless way now uh, because in the beginning of the video I'm probably pretending that I'm about to put the top up but uh, frankly I'm not it's uh, it's up when I get here and I just wanted to leave it up and then uh, whatever anyway let's just do this real quick so you can see the car with the uh, <laughs> with the top up. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, here you see the um, original uh, stamp with the Mercedes star. That can't be duplicated. That tells you that it's an original top on this car. Uh, you see the clarity of the uh, of the plastic there is amazing, as is the stitching uh, that's still in it, the fabric. Uh, this is a remarkably well-preserved soft top uh, for original. Really almost miraculous to see. Uh, inside, same thing. None of the little tendrils hanging from the support frames. No rust on the support frames. Uh, just all very nice and proper everywhere you look. So, Okay, to get it down, we're going to lower those visors. We're going to pull out this manual here and use these Mercedes tools. And again, this is going to be miserable one-handed, but we're going to try it. So, Actually, I tell you what, it's easier with the windows down as well. So let's just do that real quick. See, they work nice and smooth. Lovely. All right. So I've spun that little mechanism there, which again, it looks like something off a U-boat or Panzer tank. I just love German hardware of this vintage. And I'm going to poke it up in the... Oh, for the love of God. This is why women don't like these things anymore, by the way. Anyway, there it is, poked up in the front. And I don't need that tool anymore. So now I can reach in here into the back, release this handle that looks like the window crack. Actually, that was already up. That's interesting. Well, okay, so now it's released. I'm releasing the safety catch, and the back end should lift up, which it does. Okay, very nice. And now, using that same handle, I can release this top cover. Uh, here you see where you stow the soft top all very nice you know on a rotten car they didn't clean in there obviously because why would they uh, but on a rotten car that's going to be all kind of nasty and rusty anyway so we're going to lower this top down in there you want to be careful to push this uh, these old straps they actually still have some elastic to them which is impressive um, but anyway they tend to oh, let me push that in a little bit oh for the love of god Okay, well anyway, there it is. So anyway, that pushes down. I like to walk around and tuck these little corners in. I'll tuck that in. Tuck that in. And push down. You know what, this is why I don't do this damn thing one-handed. Okay, that's folded in a little bit better now. And now I've got to go around and re-tuck that back. God, I tell you what. <laughs> this would have been much easier if uh, I had someone to help. Anyway, there it is. And you give this guy a push. Oh, latches into place. And there it is, with only a little bit of sweat. Uh, you've got the top down in this German Roadster, so very nice stuff. I'm going to uh, pause, regroup, and start going again. All right, tag on the back, everything good to go. Let's do this. So, 
All right, one thing I can tell you that the build quality of this car, like a bank vault. I mean, without sounding too contrived, it's just absolutely incredible. Uh, let me stand out for a minute. We'll go through a couple things. And it really was, you know, I think that was their advertising campaign at the time, engineered like no other car in the world. I mean, that was true. I mean, there was nothing out there that was put together like this. I mean, look at this door latch uh, with the striker there. I mean, it's just... It's just absolutely remarkable. I mean, this was true German engineering of an age gone by, which just doesn't exist anymore. And uh, you can really, really see it in every detail. Uh, of course, it weighed... It, <laughs> weighed as much as the Queen Mary, you know, for sport light or super light, it really wasn't, but uh, the build quality is fantastic. Uh, it also had the thing that I showed you in that 126 the other day, where uh, climate controlled air comes through this into the door panel and then emanates through the perforation uh, here, so it gives you coolness or heat uh, or, you know, whatever it is you're, you're trying to get going, so all these little subtle things. Uh, even though they improved the uh, seat um, you know, the orthopedics, they, they feel better than earlier SLs. Uh, they did not make them power. They're all still manual adjustments, as is the top, of course. And uh, the Jaguar XJS at the time, they moved to a power seat, which, uh, you know, was trying to take it to Mercedes. But, yeah, they failed. People still like the Benz. But I mean, even the adjust, these big adjustable knobs, the ratcheting motion to move it up and down. It just reeks of Panzer tank quality engineering. Uh, that's just epic. Uh, there's the package shelf in the back where you'd get seats if you wanted. I don't know why you would. You'd have to take some Canadians or toddlers with you. I don't know if they'd be happy back there. Probably not. Uh, they made uh, bigger uh, sun visors here with, um, you know, lights or whatnot. That was an improvement. On most 560s, these go to absolute shit. They start falling apart, and uh, they're awfully expensive uh, to find. Uh, this still has the uh, leather key fob. Uh, nice feature that the key, I don't know if it's, I mean, who cares? But anyway, it's still with the car. So let's fire this thing up. You got always one-handed. Oh, God. All right, so we get that in. Oh, for the love of God. All right, hold it with this hand. All right, and there's that big V8 firing to life and that really irritating Mercedes warning buzzer uh, that sort of alerts you that the, uh, you know, the Panzer tank is running out of oil pressure or the U-boat is about to sink. Let's get my seatbelt on. Uh, you don't often see these seat belts in this condition, too, with the, uh, all the composite material still around the latch. Those are often worn away or gone altogether, uh, as well as the instrument cluster. Uh, you see how orange the needles and the hieroglyphics are. Uh, in cars that spend a lot of time outside, those fade to yellow and eventually white. You get all this sort of white fungus stuff on them. Uh, this is one of the best instrument clusters that I've seen in a long time. Uh, I also like the classic vents. They actually feel kind of cheap by today's standards on a Benz, but uh, they're easy to steer uh, at your face and, you know, very nice. Uh, there was a coupe version of this car called the C107. It was an extended wheelbase with big rear seats. And the reason there are three vents there is that was the center vent was designed to go back and hit your rear seat passengers if you cared. Well, you didn't need that in the two-seater. Uh, so they replaced that in the uh, earlier cars. Uh, with a temperature gauge, Celsius in the 380s, and finally Fahrenheit in the US Model 560s. Uh, you also have all the warning lights underneath the cluster that are, you know, again, I don't know, uh, many of them indistinguishable. Uh, there you have stalks in the traditional Mercedes style. These are your windshield wipers, your cruise control, uh, your headlights over here, uh, premium unleaded fuel only. You wouldn't have needed that in Europe. That's why that's a sticker here in the United States. Uh, uh, because uh, there, there was no 87 octane in Europe at the time and probably still not today. And uh, then these uh, turn your vents on and off. Uh, these dashboards often crack uh, in the sun. One of the great failings of these cars, uh, Germany, of course, not being much of a hot weather place. Uh, this one being as perfect as it is, is a testament to the way that it's been kept. Uh, more switches, your antenna, your interior lights. It has the Becker Grand Prix radio, which uh, I'm using a uh, cassette 
adapter in to listen to my phone, which is fantastic. But let's see what we got on the radio. Oh yeah, that creepy stalker song from the police. That's interesting. This recirculates your air conditioning. This is an automatic climate control. Uh, you put it here for your normal vents, and it's all working, by the way. That's another failing in these cars, is the little uh, vacuum adjusters behind the dash fail, and it immediately defaults to defrost, so you end up getting a fogged up window with air conditioning. Uh, when it's working, it's nice. It comes out the center vents and everything's good. Uh, when you see the service records on this car, you'll see why it's working. Uh, but anyway, the lumber in it looks absolutely terrific. Beautiful burl wood, the famous Mercedes gated shifter. You see this little switch here. Uh, when you run it down and move it over, it clicks that switch. And what that does is uh, lets you fire the car off into first gear. Uh, otherwise, when you start, it's going to start in second. Uh, here's your window switches, your hazard switch. Your heated seats would be up here if it had them. Uh, this one has a power uh, passenger mirror, which is actually working, which is shocking because they rarely do. Uh, you got an armrest there. You've got these Mercedes-Benz accessory cup holders. Uh, it never came with these things, but you could buy them, and they were like, you know, 70 bucks each from the uh, from the Mercedes counter uh, if you wanted to install them. So nice that they're still there in good shape, not broken off. Uh, over here in the glove box, uh, nice to see all the original books. Uh, it's got a stamped service book, which is rare. You've got both tools, lovely, and you've got all the uh, stuff that it came with, manuals and, you know, whatever else, and hang tags for the climate control, and, you know, all very uh, well-preserved car. Get that back in. And then this is epic. You know, you always want to have service records with the car, and you get lucky when they look like this. So uh, this was obviously, again, one of these guys with a human foot collection or something, someone really creepy uh, that you wouldn't want to spend any time with, but you're very happy uh, to get one of his cars, even as 35 millimeter prints from when he bought it. Uh, you got a whole section of service records here and then the one and here's another one he went out and he bought seven keys from the Mercedes dealer why why do you need seven keys I mean I, I you know what I'm not even gonna hazard a guess but he's otherwise dated all of the records this is where he bought it for 50 grand and 98 with 6,000 miles he did put 43,000 miles on it uh, there's a 6,000 actual mile title from 98 uh, from the estate by the way um, and there's where he bought it from. And then he died, and the guy that I got it from, he isn't dead, thank God, because otherwise the first two owners of this car died, uh, and the car was sold in a state. So um, I remember we had a Pagoda a couple of years ago that everyone who'd ever owned it, that had gotten it in a divorce other than the first owner. So that car just sort of was conducive to a divorces. Hopefully this car won't kill people. Anyway, let's go for a spin. Of course, we got to wait for the gates to open. Uh, you know, another thing that's nice about this car is almost every one of these that I've ever bought, uh, even when they're really, really nice, they have been, I won't say neglected, but a lot of the maintenance items were ignored because these things are victims of their own reliability. You can just do nothing and they're still going to pretty much start and run every day. And that's unfortunately what a lot of people do. Uh, this guy was some kind of a nut. He kept driving it to the Mercedes dealer and making them do stuff. So. Uh, when I put it up in the air, it had new subframe mounts, engine mounts, transmission mounts, steering arms. I mean, all the, this drives like it had zero miles on it. It is the best driving 560 SL uh, that I have ever been in. And I've been in a lot of these things, so that's saying something. Uh, this windshield was done by the other detailer, Kevin. Dalton did anything to do with this one, uh, which is... You know what? It doesn't look like Kevin's really got his windshield shit together either, so. <laughs> and it's a runner. You know, some of these 560s are fast and some aren't. But um, anyway, look, we'll pick it up again at the end of the road because the windshield looks like crap. This thing's an absolute runner, and uh, I think that's a testament to the way that it's been maintained. 
Uh, but look, I'm not gonna keep rambling on. I'm gonna give you this real quick. To me, this is what an this is what a luxury car was and what I wish some of the current luxury car makers would return to. It doesn't try to wow you with all kinds of gadgetry and gimmickry. It is just epic build quality, bank vault construction, you know, the finest materials, the finest engineering, a car that's built to a standard and not a cost, uh, which is obvious considering it was basically 140 grand uh, in uh, today dollars back in 1989. And it just, you feel the engineering and the quality in every millimeter of the car. And that's something that I think is missing from all this crap today where you get, you know, Instagram on your dashboard or Facebook or, you know, the perfumes that come out of the things or whoopee cushions and tests. I mean, it's all crap. Uh, compared to wood, nuts, bolts, leather, everything done to an absolute standard, uh, which feels terrific. And that is, I think, why these cars are aging so well. Uh, for one thing, I mean, this is an 89 model, which is new enough to have an airbag, good seat belts, you know, safe crumble zones, all that other crap that Mercedes is famous for, uh, while at the same time looking incredibly vintage uh, because it's a car that was designed in the 60s and came out in 72. So you can comfortably drive this thing from, you know, Florida to California in incredible comfort and safety, uh, you know, while still looking like you're in a very vintage car. And to me, that is one of the treats of the, uh, of the R107 and specifically the later models like this one. Uh, but anyway, what an epic car. Uh, this one is going to be for sale at Auto House of Naples, uh, 89 uh, very much original, stunning service records, 49,000 miles, uh, really one of the best 107s that I've seen in a long, long time. There are a lot of turds out there and a lot of polished turds and uh, it's nice to find one that's so uh, well maintained and original and, you know, just not buttered up. This thing is a very, very honest car and uh, that's just awesome. So you can see it at autohousenaples.com or give them a call at 239-263-8500. Uh, thank you so much for having a look today. I'm gonna try to get a video out early next week because otherwise I'm leaving Wednesday for North Carolina and I don't know if I'm gonna be able to check in from up there or not. Uh, you know, sometimes the drugs and booze just kind of, you know, take me away from reality. So who knows? Uh, but we'll try to get one in Monday or Tuesday. Thank you again for the 100,000 subscriber thing. Thank you again to the people who have sent stuff. And I promise I'm going to return, uh, you know, a mail or a letter or whatnot. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, we will see you with the next one. Take care.